Okay, we're going to continue talking about the calculus of parametric curves. Okay, so if we have a parametric curve, that on some particular part of it satisfies the vertical line test. So, for example, look at this. You could have a curve that does something like this, and say over this interval, A to B, it satisfies the vertical line test. Then we can reasonably ask, what is the area underneath the curve and above the x-axis? A different color. Like this. What is this area? Right? So, this is at least a, a quantity that makes sense. We'd like to know if there's a way to calculate it just given the equations of the parametric curve. Right? So, recall parametric curve, it's t goes into x of t, y of t, and this could be where we start. Let's say this is x of t0, y of t0, and this could be where we end, x of t1, y of t1, okay? And over some range of t, we're actually doing this part of the curve, and we'd like to know the area underneath it, right? So, if this was just a function from the x-axis, then this would be trivial. We just integrate the function over the interval a to b. But that's not what we can do here, right? So, note the expression a to b uh, y of t means nothing, right? Okay, because firstly, a and b are on the x-axis, right? y is a function of t, so this is just literally a meaningless expression. This, this, this just can't mean anything, right? This is not going to give us this quantity. So, this is not the way to get the area underneath this particular part of the curve, right? We're going to have to be more careful about what would do that for us. So, let's think about it some more, yeah? So, there is some point in time where the curve hits this, right? So this here is x of t, y of t, but some particular point in time. And let's call that point in time uh, t subscript a, right? So this is x of t subscript a, y of t subscript a. And it lives right here, right? It lives right here. And the same is true for this thing right here. This is x of t subscript b, y of t subscript b, and it lives right here. Yeah? So over the time interval t of a to t of b, this is when the curve is traveling over this piece right here. Yeah? Cool. So if we want to get some reasonable expression um, for what this actually is, then I'm just going to tally it to you, and then I'm going to try and explain why it's the reasonable expression. The expression is this. It is from time t of a to time t of b. It is y of t, and then it is x prime of t dt. And we can rewrite this like this. Okay, so... Um, formally, and again, this is something I don't like to do, but formally, you can somewhat see that this looks like a reasonable expression because if you cancel the d dt's, which you can't do, just a formal, formal expression, but if you cancel the dt's, then you get dy dx, which is kind of like the expression you would have if you had a function from the x-axis, right? So it looks like the right expression just for this formal reason. but that is just something you 
might consider useful to remember it by. That's not how I want you to think of it. It's certainly not what's, it's certainly not the reason. Um, the reason is as follows. So let's think about what x of t is. So x of t, as we move over this time interval a to b, it's just increasing, right? So if we have, say, x, let's actually take a different function, x tilde, uh, which is going from the positive real numbers to the positive real numbers. Yeah? And let's just think about what it does on just the integers. So suppose you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, right? Then x of tilde of 1, x of tilde of 2, and so on are some other numbers. So you can think about this as like a tape measure where this is the distance between whatever, where we, well, this could be zero, say. So this is like one inch, this is two inches, this is three inches. And then x of, x tilde of zero, x tilde of one, x tilde of two, maybe x tilde of three is over here, right? Maybe x tilde of four is here. This is like a rearranging of the tape measure, where some distances are now going to be stretched and some distances will be shrunk, right? That's what you can think of this function x tilde doing, right? So we have our ordinary distance along the x-axis here, and that's not necessarily what's happening with our x of t, right? So as t moves along, it's not necessarily going along that way, just like we would do if we were just moving along the x-axis by how far we are from point A. Because x of t, y of t, uh, you think of as just the position of a b at time t. So it could be going incredibly slowly over some period, right? So it might take 100 years to go from here to here. And then it might take a millisecond to go from here to here. So it's absolutely not just going along in a straightforward fashion from A to B uh, the way it would be if we were just integrating along the x-axis. So it's, an, it's actually a rescaling of the real axis is what's going on, just like this is like a rescaling of your tape measure. So when we consider the expression of trying to integrate underneath uh, the interval a to b, but we have to use our variable t, which everything's defined in, then we have to take account of the fact that x of t is a rescaling of the real axis, right? And that's actually what this thing is. This thing is taking account of the fact that we have a rescaling of the real axis. Okay. So, how is this making sense? So, for example, if we uh, were going incredibly slowly from, say, some, let's say t of a was some number like one, and then t of b was a hundred billion trillion, right? then that means we were actually going incredibly slowly if it takes us that amount of time to cover this distance. Yeah? But then if that is the case, then x prime of t is actually really, really small because going this, going this tiny amount of distance takes us uh, 100 billion years. Whatever, right? So then this incredibly small number we put here compensates for the fact that we are integrating over an incredibly wide interval from whatever some time one up to 100 billion years, right? So this thing is a natural thing that will reset or rescale whatever messing around with the real axis is going on by the fact that we have x of t that we're using to go along rather than just going along with respect to the x variable on the x axis. That's how this thing makes sense. That's why it works. This thing is taking account of the fact that we have a different way to measure the real line with this new tape measure defined by x of t. Okay. Cool. So if you mess around with that, just think about it for a little bit, you will start to believe that this thing is the right thing to compensate. Right? When we are going very slowly, then this is a very wide interval of time, but then this is a very small number compensating for this fact that we're integrating over a very wide interval. Conversely, if this is a very small interval of time, we're going very fast, but then this is a big number, 
right? which will make sense because we might be only integrating over a very small interval from 1 to 1.01 or something. Right? Cool. So this is why this thing makes sense. And this is a formula you'll need to actually integrate the error underneath the graph. So again, um, this is the start of multivariable calculus. We have many, many formulae. And, and the way to learn the subject is not to memorize them. Do not try and memorize this expression just as a sequence of symbols. You've got to get a feeling for it. You've got to start to believe it. You've got to have reasons for it. And I'm trying to give you those. And those are the ones you have to focus on. Um, cool. All right, so let us see if we can squeeze an example in. OK, not very easily, but let us at least do a warm up for the example. So, so this is example three. So we have this curve. And we are asked to find the area underneath one loop. OK, first we have to convince ourselves we actually just have uh, loops of this curve. Uh, so we're going to have to get some kind of picture of this actual curve. So let's try and do that just here. And then we'll make a bigger picture in a second. So let's see. When theta equals 0, then sine is 0. This is 0. Cos of 0 is 1. So everything at, at theta is 0 is 0. So we start here for sure. Right? And then as theta increases, so theta is always going to be bigger than sine theta. And if we just do a little calculation, if we just take the derivative, what do we have? We have r1 minus cosine of theta. And that thing is always going to be bigger than equal to 0. So this is always increasing with respect to theta, right? So if this is the motion of rb and we have theta instead of time, it is always going to the right. Yeah? Sometimes it can be actually stopped, but it's always going to go to the right. Cool. And then this thing itself, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, well, this thing is always also going to be positive, right? And it is 0 when theta equals 0, and also when we're equal to 2 pi. And that's the only time it's 0, right? Um, because any other value of cosine, this thing will actually be positive. So this thing is only 0 when we are at 0 or 2 pi. So as we go along to the right, with, with, uh, as theta increases, then x of theta goes along to the right. And this thing is going to start off at 0. It's going to go up. And then it's going to go down. It's a continuous function. But it's only going to hit 0 again at 2 pi. So sure enough, there is some kind of a, a loop. And we don't know much about it. But it's definitely some sort of loop where we go around like this. So this is where we are at 0. And this is where we are at 2 pi. Yeah? Cool. So as we, this is a periodic function with respect to theta. So as theta continues, then we're just going to have this thing repeated. So we're going to have another loop and another loop. And it's just going to go on, right? OK, good. So. The question is, what is the error in the one loop of the curve? Well, that has to be something like this. And we're going to have to use this formula that we have over here. And we're going to think about what is the theta range that we have to talk about. Well, it's going to have to be from theta is 0 to theta is 2 pi. Right? That's going to have to be the range. Cool. So let's work on that when we erase the board.
input again. Functions, we have this guy. Uh, no, cosine of theta. And our task is to find the area underneath one of the loops, and we've already established that we have a picture like this, uh, where this is where we are at time zero, or angle zero, oops, and this is where we are at angle two pi. I'd rather have t than theta, but that's just the formulation of the question. Okay, so uh, what else do we know? We actually know this distance too, right? Because when we stick in uh, two pi into this, we're just going to have uh, r times two pi. So this is two pi r in distance. Okay, just to complete the picture. All right, so we know that we can't just simply integrate y of t. It's meaningless to do that. We have to integrate over a period of time, right? And the period of time has to be from where we are here and to where we are here. So it's from 0 to 2 pi. And then what is the thing? Well, it's going to be y of theta, and then dx by d theta, d theta, and then d theta. Again, this is the height. This is the rescaling of the x-axis by x of theta. And then we integrate respect to d theta, of course, because everything's in terms of theta. All right, so that's our formula. And then we just put in the pieces. So if we put in the pieces, what do we have? So we're going to have an r squared. Pull out straight away. And if we differentiate this guy, we are going to get 1 minus cosine theta. So it's like 1 minus cosine theta everything squared, d theta, let's expand it. Let's take out this r squared, 1 minus 2 cosine theta, cosine squared theta, d theta. And now we're happy because now this is a standard integral, right? So this cosine squared theta, we have to use this half angle formula, which is... Uh, this right. Pretty sure it's this. Indeed. So then we put in these pieces. So use a sentence using put into this thing, call this thing star. becomes r squared integral 0 pi over, oops, 2 pi. So we are going to get a half from this thing. So this will be 3 over 2. This will be minus cosine theta. And this will be cosine 2 theta over 2 d theta. Right? Put brackets over this. And then what? And then this 2 pi to 0. And then we have uh, 3 over 2. And this is theta. And the antiderivative of this, we're going to have uh, 2 sine of theta. And then the antiderivative of this, we're going to have sine of 2 theta over 4. When we differentiate this, we get this, right? And then this nicely simplifies, because when we plug in 2 pi and 0 into this, both the signs will cancel. So all we're going to get is just r squared uh, times 3 pi. Right? And that's the answer. Cool. So the area underneath this one loop is that. It is r squared, or well, 3 r squared pi. Computationally, it is not difficult, right? This is not a difficult trig integral. 
But what is difficult is having the right formula. So your attention, your effort should be going into understanding why this is the correct expression. Okay, cool. All right, so that is one of the things we have to learn. Another thing we have to learn is, is how to integrate surfaces of revolution. So, let's recap just the classical formula. So, we learn to do this for functions from the real line to the real line, right? So if we have some function like this, f, and we have some interval a to b, then if we revolve the graph around the x-axis, so we're revolving like this, okay? And then we consider what shape this thing sort of traces out. Imagine it traces out. It's gonna be some kind of cylindrical type shape. We wanna find the surface area of that thing. It's gonna be a two-dimensional, type shape, right? And how did we do it? Well, we said, okay, I'm gonna cut things up into little pieces using this strategy I've talked about before, what I call the Riemann sum machine. And on each little piece, we'll try and understand that particular expression, because on each little piece, then this function looks, looks a lot like a linear function, right? This is very well approximated by its tangent line. So if you look at this particular little piece, then it's like this, let me improvise something here. This is like, just some kind of a band, but it's not a band where it's flat, right? So it's some kind of band when you rotate this round, but it's not a band that looks like this. It's not like flat, because there's a kind of angle to it. It's like an angle to this band, right? So, uh, yeah, imagine like this is a slice through, through the tip of a rocket, right? Uh, then there's, there's an angle, right? So we have to take account of this because when we have this angle and we open up the band, then the thickness of the band will be related to this quantity right here, right? Related to this quantity right here. So we have to understand this quantity, right? Not this quantity. That is not the thickness of the band. The thickness of the band is this quantity, right? So when we did this, no, F is from R to R. Then what did we do? We just blew up this picture over here. So this is the blow up. This is what it looks like. Let's take the green colors. Okay. And it depends, of course, on the slope, right? As you might expect. So if this is how far we're going across, say this is delta of x, then how far up is the relevant quantity and then just because this is well approximated by the tangent line, how far up is given by this, where, let's say this is x right here, let's call this x, let's call this xk. Right? So then by Pythagoras, this thing is gonna be the square root of delta x squared plus delta x f prime of xk squared, which we can just pull out like this. Okay, so this guy right here is indicating this length times the delta of x, right? Where this thing is delta of x, okay? So if there was no slope, then it just would be delta of x, but the bigger the slope, the bigger this quantity is as you'd expect, right? So that's one piece of it, that's the thickness of the band, and then we have the circumference of the band. Right? And if we look at this expression here, if we agree that this is xk, then this distance here is f of xk, right? Because it's just how far up the graph is above xk. So this band here has got a circumference, which will be given by two pi, f of x k, and then the thickness, which will be given by this thing, one plus f prime of x, oops, x k squared times delta of x. That thing is our expression for the thickness of the band, and then we sum over all the bands, 
and then we take the Riemann sum and we ultimately end up with the expression, I'll put it over here, end up with this expression, the integral from a to b to pi f of x square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. Okay, that was just meant to be a very quick recap of how we have the surface of revolution when we have a function from r to r. Okay? That's not what we have, though. That's not what we have. We have now a parametric curve. And on the parametric curve, we'll have some little interval. So let's say this is the parametric curve. And there'll be some interval, say over a to b, where the parametric curve satisfies the vertical line test. So we can talk about what would be the surface of revolution if we rotated it around the x-axis. Yeah? But again, the parametric curve is in terms of t, not in terms of x. So this formula is meaningless now. This is not the right formula. It's not even the right variable integrating in. We have to develop a new formula. Right? And it's somewhat analogous to the way we developed the formula for the arc length of a parametric curve. So we're going to do this kind of stuff, work out these pictures, now in the context of the parametric curve, get the right formula, and then we're going to, uh, and then I guess we'll be happy. Right? So let's do that after I clean the board. formula for the uh, surface of revolution when we have a general parametric curve. So given parametric curve, we are assuming that there's some interval of time on which this satisfies the horizontal line test. So let us make a picture. can be doing some weird stuff over here, but let's say over here it's satisfying the horizontal line test. So suppose that this thing right here is where we are at time s0. And this point right here is where we are at time s1. Okay. And we are trying to figure out what is going to be the surface of revolution when we take this particular piece right here and rotate it around the x-axis. So it's going to be something which looks like this and like this. And we're going to do it in the same way as before. We're going to have some kind of cutting up into bands and then figuring out what it looks like on bands. But this time we can't do the cutting with respect to the x-axis because it's not a function defined from x. It's a function defined in terms of time. So we have to cut it up in terms of time. So this is how we're going to do things. So let delta of t be s1 minus s0 over n. So n is some large number. It will go to infinity. n large. Okay. And then we're going to consider all the time intervals, the first one from S0 to S0 plus delta of t, and so on, and so on, and so on. So let's do it like this. So t0 will be our starting time, S0. And then we'll say tk plus 1 is tk plus delta of t. Right? Uh, for k is equal to 0, 1, up to n minus 1. And then that gives us that tn is s1, which is our stop time. Right? Cool. So if we consider some particular interval in time, let's say this one right here, so say this thing is x of tk, y of tk right here, and then this 
is where we move forward in time by delta of t. So this thing is x of tk plus delta of t, y of tk plus delta of t. Okay, so we are going to consider, going to consider what happens over this little period of time when we rotate around the x-axis. So let's take a look. This is the band we're going to form. Not very straight lines, but it goes all the way down like this, like this, like this, like this. Right? So we're going to have to figure out this length right here, and then, of course, the circumference of the band. First, we figure out this length. So I'm going to take this picture here and blow it up onto a bigger scale. So blow it up onto a bigger scale like this, and what do we see? We have the kind of curve looking like this, say. And what we have is this thing. And once again, this guy right here is x of tk, y of tk right here. This guy is x of tk plus delta of t y of tk plus delta of t, okay? And now we're going to try and figure out that length, and we're going to do this triangle that we did before. And we're going to figure out this length by approximating this by its tangent line, effectively, and trying to uh, figure out the hypotenuse of this triangle. So. The actual quantity we have, the exact quantity we have for this base here is this. It's x of tk plus delta of t. It's x of tk, right? And the actual exact quantity for this side is this. It's y of tk plus delta of t minus y of tk. Okay, and as we've talked about a number of times, and hopefully is, is now very familiar to you, when we have some function and we just change it slightly, we get a very good approximation by its tangent line, right? So, this is just doing this from first principles even. So, if we just look at this, as delta of t tends to zero, then this thing is going to be like the derivative at tk, right? So if we multiply by the other side, we have that x of tk is really a lot like delta of t, and then the derivative here. And then there'll be some error, but the error will be of order of delta of t squared. I don't know if you can see it down there. Okay, so we really do a very good job approximating this thing by just the derivative times delta of t, and then this thing by the derivative delta of t. Yeah? Cool. All right, so. Then by Pythagoras, what is this quantity going to be? We're going to square this and square this and take the square root. We can pull out the delta of t. So we'll have delta of t square root of x prime of tk squared plus y prime of tk squared. And that thing is incredibly good approximation for this line interval. And whatever error we have from this is just from this approximation. Uh, so it will come out as a delta of t squared order error, which is tiny compared to delta of t, which is the size of this thing, okay? So the error is negligible compared to the actual size of the expression itself. We can morally forget about it. So that thing is our expression for this thing, which is, again, the thickness of the band, right? And look at this picture. So the thickness of the band, that's this expression here. Let's put it over here. That's this expression here. But now we need the circumference of the band. And the circumference we'll get from the radius. If we look at this from the side, we're just going to see just like a circle, right? So we need this quantity right here, okay? 
and it is given just by y of tk, because the coordinates of this point are x of tk, y of tk. Okay, an important point. This is again in variable t, so there's nothing to do with the height of y above the x-axis. y is not defined in terms of x. Yeah? This is where the bumblebee or whatever flying object you want to visualize as, as giving you the path. This is where it is at time t, or time tk, and its height above the x-axis given by this. Right? So I'm trying to keep clear that this is not a function from the x-axis. Cool. So if we have our band, let's draw the band. And it kind of looks like this. And this is this quantity right here. And then this length right here is y of tk. Okay? So our actual expression for the surface area of the band, so surface area of band is just going to be 2 pi y of tk, which is the circumference, times the thickness, which is this expression here, square root of x prime of tk squared plus y prime of tk squared, and then delta of t, and that's it, right? So if we sum this, because we have a whole bunch of different bands, right? So the first band is from the time interval, um, I wrote S0, but this is the same as T0. So from T0 to T0, uh, from time T0 to time T1, which will say be this little band here. And then the next band would be from time T1 to T time T2, which would be say this one and so on and so on. We have all these distinct little bands, right? And summing up, the surface area we get from each band will actually give us the total surface area we get from rotating this part of the parametric curve. So total surface area, so surface area, I'm going to abbreviate to surface area to s dot a, will be the sum from k equals 0 to infinity 2 pi y of tk plus prime of tk squared no? times delta of t. And then what? <laughs> then this is just an ordinary Riemann sum. It's a Riemann sum in the variable t. So we can think about this thing as just, this whole thing here is just a function in t. So it will say, if it say it was the function g of t, then we'd have g tk of delta of t. And then you would know that this thing is just going to tend to the sign there underneath the graph, right? So what should be hopefully clear to you is that as n goes to infinity, just because it's a Riemann sum, this thing is going to tend to the integral over the time period we start at time s0 to S1 of all of these pieces, 2 pi y of t, square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared dt. Cool. All right, so this thing is indeed the exact formula for the surface area when we rotate a piece of the curve, of the parametric curve. And pieces of it should be familiar, right? So this part is the part we've seen before when we just try and calculate the arc length of the parametric curve, right? And then this part comes from the circumference. And uh, one of the... Yeah, one of the main things to remember is that this is to do with t and not to do with integrating with respect to x. Uh, so we are setting up our intervals in a completely different way, right? It is no longer the case that dt is the width like this. That is not true anymore, right? That is not true anymore. Cool. All right. So with this formula, we can actually 
do these kind of questions, we can calculate the surface area of surfaces of revolution given by parametric curves, and that's what we'll practice next time.